Good morning, everyone. It's my absolute privilege and honor to introduce the Don Luke Childs lecturer, Dr. Ken Miller, today. Dr. Miller is professor of biology at Brown University, he is life sciences advisor to the New Tower on PBS, and co-author of the nation's leading high school biology textbook, which many of you should be well acquainted with. In addition to his research work in cell biology, he has written extensively on evolution, and in 2005, he served as lead witness in the Kitzmiller v. Dover trial on evolution and intelligent design. His most recent book is The Human Instinct, How We Evolved to Have Reason, Consciousness, and Free Will. I finished it the other day, and it is a clear, logical, and off-filled look at our unique position in the universe, and why that shouldn't and doesn't contradict any of the latest scientific findings. Among his honors are the Public Understanding of Science Award from AAAS, the Stephen J. Gould Prize from the Society for the Study of Evolution, the Gregor Mendel Medal from Villanova University, and the Leitari Medal from Notre Dame University. On a personal note, I was fortunate to take Dr. Miller's advanced cell biology class while I was a graduate student at Brown, and he's easily one of the best teachers I've ever had. He also wrote one of my letters of recommendation for my pre-doctoral fellowship from the NIH, so it's safe to say he's done a lot for me for my career, and I'm pretty excited that he's here. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Miller. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Steve, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. Um, I'd like to thank everyone at Portsmouth Abbey for having me here again. This is my third visit to your wonderful school. Um, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank you for that introduction. Uh, whenever I speak anywhere, I like, always like to bring along my own introductory slide so I can tell you who I really am. Here I am. Um, I'm a, a cellular biologist. I work on biological membranes. My main research tool is the electron microscope. That's a picture with my microscope in my laboratory at Brown. Um, and the sort of work I do is published in journals like Cell, the Journal of Cell Biology, and so forth. Um, I think it's safe to say one of the reasons I'm here today is because quite a few years ago, a former student of mine talked me into doing something that was absolutely crazy at the time, and that was partnering with him to write a high school biology textbook. And at first I resisted, but eventually Joe Levine, my, my partner in this, uh, in this respect, talked me into it. And over the years, Joe and I have written a whole series of books, and I understand that the latest one is currently in use uh, here at Portsmouth Abbey, so thank you very much for doing that. Now, at a research university like Brown, uh, writing textbooks is actually not part of the job description, and writing high school textbook is most definitely not part of the job description, but it's still been one of the most interesting experiences of my life. Um, I live in Rehoboth, Massachusetts, not too far from here, and both of my daughters went to Dighton Rehoboth Regional High School. My oldest daughter, Lauren, who is a wildlife biologist today, was actually my first editor because she was a freshman in high school when I was writing first drafts of our first manuscript, and Lauren helped me get the writing level right, and I'm grateful to her for that. But Tracy, my younger daughter, was not as lucky as Lauren, and she had to think about this. She had to suffer the indignity of using her old man's textbook for freshman biology at Dyke Rehoboth High School. So and that was the book with the elephant on the cover you can see in the upper right hand corner. Now, um, I lived in Rehoboth for more than 30 years, and for a while a lot of people in town knew who I was, but not because of what I did for a living. For about eight years, I was kind of like the commissioner of the softball program in Rehoboth. Um, so I would run the spaghetti suppers to raise money for the girls' softball league, I trained our volunteer umpires. I coached one of the all-star teams in the summer, so they all kind of knew me as a softball guy. But they didn't really know what I, what I did in the real world. Then one day, the high school adopted that book. My name is on the cover. My picture's inside. And all of a sudden, there it was. So about a month into that school year, and you might think it's you know, really kind of cool to have the high school in your town use a book that you wrote. I guess it is. But about a month into that school year, I'm driving up to the high school to pick Tracy up after field hockey practice. And when I pull in front of the school, there's a woman I know from softball, another coach, her name is Bonnie Kelly. And Bonnie saw my little red pickup truck, got very excited, and she flagged me down. So I pulled up and I rolled down the window, I said, hey Bonnie, what's up? And she was very excited. She said, Ken, Ken, you wrote the book they use in the high school. And I, I you know, I sort of puffed my chest out, I smiled. 
And I said, yes, Bonnie, I did. And then she looked me straight in the eyes and she said, funny thing is you don't seem that smart. <laughs> so I've never been sure what to make of that. Um, I decided I was going to take it as a compliment in one sense or another. Um, but one of the things about writing a textbook like this is when I first started to do this, I thought biology was not controversial. Every American loves science. Everybody wants to hear the story of life. But I was wrong. And it turns out that many things in our textbook, in certain parts of the country, evolution being the big one, but these days also climate change, are really quite controversial. And what happened in some states, and I'm not making any of this up, is there was a school district in which the principal became so concerned about the evolution chapters in our book that he had them glued together so that students would not have to read them. In another state, a warning label was put on our book, kind of like it was a pack of cigarettes, to warn students that evolution was discussed in the book and reminding them that evolution was just a theory, not a fact. And in two states, um, I was actually called as a witness in federal court, one in Georgia and one in Pennsylvania, to testify on the teaching of evolution in our textbooks. Uh, the second case, the one in Pennsylvania, gathered national, if not international, attention. There were two television specials made about the trial, and four books had been written about it. So it was an extraordinary thing. And one of the first things that confronted me as an author was that people would tell me that your book presents the scientific view about evolution, but that view is anti-religious. It's an atheistic point of view. And I thought, well, you know, I'm not the best person in this particular regard, but I'm still an active Catholic. I attend Mass every Sunday. I receive the sacraments. Um, I attend Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church in Seacom. Um, and I thought, no, I know very well that evolution is not anti-religious. I started to speak out of that point of view. And eventually, people asked me to explain it and explain it and explain it again. So I went ahead and I wrote a book. And the book is called Finding Darwin's God. And the subtitle is A Scientist's Search for Common Ground Between God and Evolution. And I thought this would be a little book. Now what I mean by a little book is mom and dad would be really happy to get a copy, okay? Uh, my department chair would be amused to see a cell, biology, a cell biologist writing a book about evolution to begin with, let alone about evolution and religion, and that would pretty much be it. But to my astonishment, this book has now gone through 39 printings and reprintings, over and over again. It's used in college courses all over the country on religion and science, and I know that because three or four times a semester I get an email from a student. You never know where they're coming from. Sometimes it's from Liberty Baptist College. Other times it's from Notre Dame. Other times it's from Berkeley. And the student will say, Dr. Miller, we're going to discuss your book tomorrow in class, um, um, and uh, I haven't had time to read it, so <laughs> could you tell me the most important things about it so I can participate in the discussion? Um, um, and I usually uh, tell those students, well, I'd be glad to do that, but first, could you give me your, the name of your professor so I can copy him or her on my email response? Then I never hear from the student again. Um, but it's an interesting thing, and it's drawn me sort of into the fray about what does evolution mean, what does science mean in general for people of faith? And as soon as you start to address that question, you run into something. And that is, in the popular media, there's a real affection for the God versus science theme. Many people love to see it as a clash of ideas. This is a cover of Time Magazine a few years ago in which they invited a very well-known evolutionary biologist, also an atheist, from Oxford University, and really a friend of mine named Richard Dawkins, to debate the issue with Dr. Francis Collins, who headed the Human Genome Project and is now the head of the National Institutes of Health, who is an evangelical Christian. So it's a very interesting debate. And this debate, I'm sure, sold a lot of magazines because it put the idea that religion and science were in conflict with each other on the cover of the magazine. But as Francis Collins very quickly showed in his written contributions, they're not in conflict at all. 
Nonetheless, this idea of conflict continues to permeate society. Uh, this is a picture one of my friends from Florida sent me that they'd seen at a local church in the community. If man evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? And I can't tell you how many times when I've given a lecture at a college, somebody during the Q&A has gotten up and said, if we evolved from apes or monkeys, why are they still here? And I've heard it so many times, I have a stock answer to it. And that is what I'll tell the student is, sir, I'll answer your question in a minute. But first, I have a question for you. Where did Protestants come from? And they look at me very, very confused. And I say, now come on, let me help you out. 95 theses nailed to the church door. Martin Luther, the Reformation. Oh, oh, oh. Um, then they say, oh, I guess they came from Catholics. Then I say, okay, are Catholics still here? And then all of a sudden they realize why that's an answer to the question. Catholics didn't turn into Protestants, but rather the Christian church split into two. Monkeys didn't turn into people. In fact, we share a common ancestor with all other primates. They didn't produce us, but we share a common ancestor. And that, that is a truth of evolution, that we share common ancestors with every other form of life. And that's the answer to it. But nonetheless, this intellectual tradition that basically science and faith are in conflict is actually an American invention that goes back to the late 19th century in a book by Andrew White called The History of the Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom. And this name, if you will, that science and faith are in conflict is so common that when you have someone like Pope Francis who speaks out in support of science, there is shock. And in case you didn't see it from a few years ago, this is in the first year of his papacy. Pope Francis was asked about this, and he said, look, evolution and the Big Bang are real. Francis declares evolution and Big Bang theory are real. God is not, quote, in his words, a magician with a magic wand. Now this really confused an awful lot of people. And I know this because both Time and Newsweek called me up for comment and they both asked me, isn't it shocking that the Pope has come out in favor of evolution? And my answer to both of them was, no, he's actually the fourth Pope, going back to Pius XII, to endorse evolution. Time Magazine didn't want to hear that, so they said, thanks a lot, we'll find somebody who realizes that this is a controversy. But Newsweek actually did print my comments and those of several other, uh, other scientists and Catholics who said, no, this is entirely um, consistent with church teaching. Um, but it really does surprise people. So you might say, so which is it? Is it faith or is it science? So the question number one, and I always emphasize this for people of faith, your first question about evolution should not be, can we make it mesh with the book of Genesis? Does it in fact, um, is it consistent with um, the Apostle Paul's references to Adam um, in Paul's letters to the various congregations. No, 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 no. Christians are supposed to be interested in the truth. So your first question is simple. Is evolution true? Well, let's think about that. And let's go back actually to a time before Darwin. In fact, about 100 years before Charles Darwin wrote The Origin of Species. And the pioneers of geology, the French scientist George Cuvier, and British scientists like James Hutton and Charles Lyell, who really considered the founders of the modern science of geology, had noticed something. And that is that rocks on the Earth appeared in an orderly sequence, which they called the geologic column. And the fossils of living and extinct organisms found in that geological column fit a certain pattern. And it was actually Cuvier who first mentioned it. This is about 1780 that the fossils appear to be arranged in what he called an ancestor-descendant relationship. And today, we would call that an evolutionary progression. So the conclusion is actually very simple from science, and that is life was not created in a single burst, but living species appeared gradually over time. And throughout the fossil record, new life forms appear and older forms vanish into extinction. That is a robust pattern that goes back hundreds of millions of years. Now, the interesting thing about the geologic column 
is although the geologists of that time recognized that there were successive ages in the Earth, they weren't really sure how old they were. They thought perhaps a, a, a couple of million years. Then, at the end of the 19th century, Henry Brickell discovered radioactivity. And Brickell himself realized that radioactivity could test the reality of the geological ages. If, in fact, all these fossils had been piled up, let's say, in a single worldwide flood six to 10,000 years ago, radioactive analysis of rocks and fossils would show that. But on the other hand, if these actually corresponded to authentic ages, tens or even hundred, hundreds of million years ago, radioactivity would show that. Well, guess what happened? It passed the test. And it turns out that the geological age, the geological column went back almost an order of magnitude, 10 times farther back than anyone had ever thought. Charles Darwin, for example, hoped that the Cambrian period might be as old as 40 or 50 million years ago to allow enough time for evolution to have taken place to be consistent with his theory. Well, his guess was way off. The Cambrian period wasn't 50 million years ago, it was 530 million years ago. And all of that shown by a science that could have disproven evolution with a stroke. Now, many deniers of evolution argue that the fossil record doesn't show the intermediate forms that would be characteristic of evolution. Well, no less a body than the National Academy of Sciences wrote about this a number of years ago. And they said, man, look, there's so many intermediate forms between fish and amphibians, amphibians and reptiles, and along the primate lines of descent, that sometimes you can't tell where the transition occurs from one species to another. And that's exactly what you would expect in terms of evolution. And we see these transitions everywhere. Fish to amphibian, amphibian to reptile, and reptile to mammal. But I want to show you a really spectacular one that has turned up in the last 20 years. And that is the evolution of cetaceans, swimming mammals like whales and dolphins. Now biologists have suspected for a long time, because all whales and dolphins are carnivores, that they might have descended from land-dwelling carnivores perhaps 50 or 60 million years ago. But the intermediate forms, many people said, were missing. And many critics of evolution actually made fun of the idea of an intermediate on land that could go back into the water. And they said an animal like that wouldn't be a very good swimmer, it wouldn't be very good on land either, and such an intermediate form could not possibly have existed. Well, they kind of stopped saying that about 25 years ago when fossils that fit exactly that description basically turned up. And the fossil skeleton you see here, this was discovered in the Indus River Valley between India and Pakistan, and it was given the name Ambulocetus natans. And if you're up on your Latin, Ambulocetus is the walking whale, and natans means who swims. This was, in fact, the perfect intermediate form between land animals and others. And once biologists knew where to dig, they found others. And we now have an entire set of intermediate forms that show us exactly how whales and dolphins evolved from about 60 to about 40 million years ago from land-dwelling animals. And one of my colleagues at the University of Ohio has actually said we have such a good understanding of this macroevolutionary transition, you could almost call them poster childs for evolution, for macroevolution. But it's not just there. One of my own colleagues at Brown University, Steve Gatesy, was working in the Canadian Arctic about 10 years ago. And he looked at a rock wall and saw a little snout, a fossilized snout sticking up from the wall. He called all his buddies over. They started chipping away. And what they discovered was the perfect transitional form between fish and the earliest amphibians. It was given the name Tiktaalik, and it is a perfect intermediate between fish and amphibians. So we see all of these in the fossil record. But to many people, the most threatening thing is that we see intermediate forms that document the evolution of our own species. Um, many of these are really quite complete in terms of the fossil skulls that you see here. And it turns out that at this point, 
I often hear many people say, well, there's still a missing link between us and our primate ancestors. No, there's not. Um, in fact, what we actually have is an embarrassment of riches. There are so many fossil forms related to our species that we have discovered, and all of these have lived in just the last five million years, but there is a problem. And the problem, actually, is determining which one is our direct ancestor, which one is our second cousin, which one is sort of our crazy uncle up in the closet. But the important point is we have so many transitional forms, ancestors, that we have trouble connecting the dots. Now, the interesting thing about this, the chart of these fossils that you see here, and our species is right up here at the top. The chart that you see appeared in the journal Nature a few years ago. When I saw the chart, um, I thought, I recognize that. I've seen it somewhere before. But then I realized I couldn't possibly have seen it somewhere before because it was in a paper that was just published. So it took me a couple days to realize where I had seen a similar chart. Charles Darwin only put one figure in the origin of species, and it was a chart showing how he thought evolution would look if we had a complete understanding of the fossil record. And this is part of that diagram. And to me, the eerie thing was that the chart of the evolution of our own species looks remarkably like what Charles Darwin thought evolution would look like if, in fact, you were able to recover all of the intermediate forms. And we're close to that for our own species at this point. Um, now, how close are we? This is a friend of mine named Nick Massey. And Nick decided a couple of years ago that he wanted to see if there was a gap between the earliest humans and primate ancestors who we recognize as being non-human. So what he did is he took the literature and he mapped all of the cranium sizes of every one of these complete fossil skulls into Excel, and then he plotted them. And what you see over here is cranial capacity. Um, we Homo sapiens are up to about 14 or 1500 cubic centimeters. Our earliest ancestors only about 400. Here, 3.5 million years ago, up here at zero in the present time. And lo and behold, there simply is no gap between primate ancestors and ourselves. We see a continuous pattern of increasing size of the brain. We don't see a gap. And basically, this documents our own evolution. But I have to tell you, these are all fossils. And I'm not really a fossil guy. I am much more of an RNA and DNA guy. So I want to show you something that's even more remarkable that I really wish everybody knew. We human beings, and all of you who study biomotors, we human beings have 46 chromosomes. We each get 23 from mom and 23 from dad. That's why we got 46. All the other great apes, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, and so forth, all of them have 48, which means they get 24 from mom and 24 from dad. Now, if we share common ancestors with these guys, how is it that we are missing a pair of chromosomes? Is it possible, for example, that in the lineage leading to us, a pair of chromosomes simply got destroyed? Well, talk to any geneticist, they'll tell you, no way, man. The loss of both members of what biologists call a homologous pair would be fatal. An organism that lost both members wouldn't even be able to develop as an embryo. So there's really only one possibility. And that possibility is the two chromosomes which are still separate in each of those guys, somehow got fused together to form a single chromosome in us. And that would have dropped us, one of our ancestors, from 24 pairs down to 23. So that's the explanation. However, that's not evidence. That's just a prediction. And here's why evolution is science, not a guess, not just a theory. But here's why it's science. And that is because that prediction is testable. If these organisms share a common ancestor with us, our genome must contain a recently fused chromosome. And because we have the complete human DNA sequence, we can look and see. Now, how would we recognize a fused chromosome from among our 23 pairs? Well, here's the deal. What I've done up here is to sketch a couple little chromosome diagrams. Every chromosome has a special region at either end called the telomere, and I covered that blue. And we can recognize telomeres because they have a characteristic DNA sequence. Also, every chromosome has a special region near the center, that's red, called the centromere. That helps the chromosomes to move apart during mitosis. 
If your genome and mine contain a chromosome that had been recently fused together, you know what that chromosome should look like? That chromosome should have that telomere DNA right in the center where the two chromosomes are stuck together, and by the way, where that sequence does not belong, and it should have two centromes. And if we don't have a chromosome like that in our genome, the whole notion of human common ancestry with other primates is out the window. But if we do, it's a prediction that evolution made and molecular biology fulfilled. I'm not going to keep you in suspense. Our fused chromosome is chromosome number two. Your chromosome number two and my chromosome number two has telomere DNA in the center, it has two centromeres, and we even know the exact point where the fusion occurred. It's between base, ready for this? 114,455,823 and 114,455,838. That's where the scotch tape is, holding the two halves of our chromosome together. You couldn't get more objective proof of our evolutionary ancestry than that. So, here's the bottom line from a scientific point of view. Antiquity of rocks and fossils is confirmed by radiometric analysis. The history of our planet reveals a pattern of change and extinction that is consistent with evolution. Transitional forms, and I showed you some of them, confirm descent with modification. And molecular biology reveals how, basically, genetic changes produce new genes and novel structures. Finally, as I just mentioned, genomic studies confirm the evolutionary ancestry of modern species, including our own. Now, I did actually, in preparing uh, before the uh, assembly, I forgot to test something. And that is, I forgot I had included a video, so I'm going to say a little prayer, and I'm going to hope the audio works. We'll see if this comes out okay. But scientific concepts, despite all this evidence, concepts like evolution of the Big Bang are troubling issues for many people of faith, especially for Christians. So I'm going to show you a little clip from a NOVA program on which I was a scientific editor that sort of captures that. And if the audio doesn't come up, I'll supply my own. Okay, let me restart. Let's try this one more time. The majesty of our earth. The prayer worked. The beauty of life. Why the result of a natural process called evolution? Or the work of a divine creator? This question is at the heart of the struggle that has threatened to tear our nation apart. That's an outdated religious book. Science has shown you how. The fundamentalist Christians like Cam have. Evolution is an evil that must be fought. It's a, it's a real battle between worldviews. From battle teachers in Lafayette, Indiana, evolution is a truth that must be defended. I think they think someone will come out a victor, and I don't believe that that's going to be the case. For Christian students at Harvard College, evolution is an idea that's hard to accept. Where is God's place if everything does have a natural cause? For all of us, the future of religion, science, and science education are at stake in the creation and evolution debate. Today, even as science continues to provide evidence supporting the theory of evolution, for millions of Americans, the most important question remains, what about God? Well, as I mentioned, that's from a PBS series a number of years ago about evolution. Still one of the best television series ever done on the science of evolution. But the question is simple, and that is how can people of faith re reconcile themselves to ideas that many people are think are non-biblical, like the Big Bang and like evolution? And here you see pictures from the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. I got to see that myself for the first time a couple of years ago. Um, Put it on your list of places you must go to see. The Sistine Chapel is extraordinary with all this artwork. So here's my first, uh, first step in answering that question. How can people of faith reconcile themselves to scientific ideas that seem non-biblical? So here's a quiz. Who actually developed the mathematical foundations of what we call the Big Bang and what an astronomer would call cosmic expansion? Uh, when I asked my students this, most of them guessed Einstein. 
because in fact, uh, an expanding universe is actually predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity. But Einstein actually resisted that point of view. Einstein, who was not a believer, wanted to say that the universe was in steady state, that it always was, always would be, and therefore he didn't have to think about where the beginning of the universe came from. Well, there was a young mathematician who was a professor of physics and mathematics at the University of Louvain in Belgium. And he attended these conferences and he told Einstein repeatedly that in fact general relativity required an expanding universe. Einstein didn't trust this guy, in part because he wore, he wore a Roman collar. And this person's name is Georges Lemaitre. Uh, he is a Belgian. Um, and he is really the scientific founder of the Big Bang. Uh, in fact, um, he uh, basically uh, taught uh, after, well, I, I don't want to mention service in World War I, which is interesting, um, but he taught the rest of his life in Europe and also in the United States. Uh, and in fact, a number of books have been written about Lemaitre, one of which is called The Atom of the Universe. And Lemaitre's point was that general relativity requires a dynamic universe. That means tomorrow the universe is going to be a little bigger than it was today, but it also means last week it was a little smaller. And if you think about that, 10 years ago it was smaller still, and Lemaitre realized that at some point this means that at a point in the distant past the universe was infinitely small, which he called the cosmic atom. That is what we today popularly call the Big Bang. Now a more recent biography has been written by my friend John, John Farrell. It's called The Day without yesterday. It's about Lemaitre and Big Bang cosmology. And Lemaitre, because he remained a priest his entire life, was often asked, Father Lemaitre, how can you remain a priest? The Big Bang is not in the Bible. And his answer was the writers of the Bible were illuminated more or less on the question of salvation. But on other questions, they were just as wise or ignorant as everybody else. So it's unimportant if errors of scientific fact should be found in the Bible especially if errors relate to events that were not directly observed by those who wrote about them. And needless to say, no one was around to observe the creation of the universe itself. And he says the idea that because the authors of scripture were right in the doctrine of immortality and salvation, they also must be right on all other subjects, is simply a fallacy of people who have an incomplete understanding of why the Bible was given to us at all. And in this context, when we go back to Pope Francis' comments on the Big Bang, they're not revolutionary at all. In fact, they are very much in keeping with the intellectual tradition of scientific inquiry that actually generated the scientific method and produced people like Lemaitre. So the idea that this kind of science contradicts faith basically is contradicted by the founder of the Big Bang itself. Now, Charles Darwin was not a believer, but he refused time and time again to allow people to use evolution as evidence against religion. So, as it turns out, in 1879, uh, someone named John Fordyce wrote to Darwin and said, uh, Mr. Darwin, I am an admirer of your work. Would you please agree with me that no person can accept evolution and still call themselves a Christian? Now, Darwin was a really polite guy in his correspondence. He was always very nice to people. But he was actually irritated by Fordyce's letter. And this is what Darwin wrote back to him. And I want to, in large part, he wrote, It seems to me, Mr. Fordyce, absurd to doubt that a man may be an ardent theist and an evolutionist. Now, Darwin wasn't a theist, but he says, of course, it, it, of course you can do this. And then he referred to someone else. He referred to someone named Asa Gray, the eminent botanist. Asa Gray is a guy who would have been way more famous than he is. He is basically the founder of the science of botany in the United States. He was actually featured on a U.S. stamp a number of years ago. He founded the Arnold Arboretum. He established the, the Botanical Gardens at Harvard. And he was an elder in the Presbyterian Church. He was actually Darwin's first great proponent in the United States. And Darwin knew very, very well that Asa Gray was a person of faith and completely accepted evolution. So he said, of course you can do that, even if he did now, a more recent scientist, Theodosius Dobzhansky, is shown here. Dobzhansky was the greatest evolutionary geneticist of the 20th century. His contributions are legion. And he's the author of a very famous article that's probably more famous for his title than anything else. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. 
And boy, is that true. But it's worth reading some of the things that Gonsansky wrote within the article. The diversity of life is understandable if the creator created the living world not by caprice, but by evolution, propelled by natural selection. And then he said, it's wrong to think of creation and evolution as mutually exclusive. I, Dobzhansky, am a creationist and an evolutionist because Dobzhansky was in fact a Christian. And then he said, evolution is God's or nature's method of creation. Creation isn't something that happened in 4004 BC. It is a process that began some 10 billion years ago and is still underway today. No less a person than Pope Benedict, now retired, was asked about this by a group of Italian journalists, if a Christian, if a Catholic could accept evolution. And he said the idea that there is a conflict between evolution and creation is an absurdity. I thought it interesting that he used the same word Darwin did, absurd. Because there are many texts in favor of evolution, which appears as a reality that we must see. And what does evolution do? It enriches our understanding of life and being. Now that's sort of complicated wording. So if you, it's kind of like Pope speak. Pope's always speak in a very circular way. So if you, if you want to clear it up, do what I do. Go to that publication that at least for me makes everything clear. And that of course is the New York Post. Evolution and God do mix hope and the story. And, and I have to say, uh, a number of years ago, I spoke here over the summer at the Portsmouth Institute. And I was on a program that included a very famous opponent of evolution named William Dembski, who's actually a graduate of this school. Um, and I've always tried to remain on good terms with Bill Dembski. But during, uh, in one of his writings, and you can see his name right up here, he talked about a phenomenon that you see out west all the time called a fire rainbow. And this is a rainbow you can see sometimes right in the middle of the day, and you can see it in very high clouds. And this is a, I've seen it in real life. It's, it's, the, the colors are more intense than you see in this picture, but this is pretty good. And what Bill said was such beauty, in other words, the beauty of that you see in nature, leads me to rebel against materialism. And I thought about that. And I thought about that again and again and again. And having seen fire rainbows myself, I thought, wait a minute now. You're saying that materialism cannot account for the beauty of nature. The fire rainbow, like any rainbow, is in fact the result of materialism. It's a wholly material phenomenon. It's created by interactions of matter and energy. It's driven by the laws of physics and chemistry. Um, and in fact, so is evolution. So the notion that there's something profane about saying that what we see in nature is based in matter, um, basically, I think, is a mistake. No less a person than St. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, exhorted us to find God in all things. And I would argue that even in material phenomena like this, one can find God. And that God is surely present in the beauty of the fire rainbow. And to support that contention, it's not a scientific one, but to support that, I'll put some poetry from two of my favorite poets, one of whom is Gerard Manley Hopkins. And Hopkins, by the way, who was a priest, wrote, Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his. And more recently, Thomas Burton, who was also a Catholic priest, wrote, the gate of heaven is everywhere. And I think this is what Ignatius Loyola meant by finding God in all things. So the concern that many people have is that evolution is just a chance random process and it proves that we are nothing but mistakes of nature. But the reality is that life is material and the capacity for life is actually built into the physics and chemistry of matter. That means evolution is an inherent and predictable pattern of, of nature and if the ultimate cause, if the ultimate cause of the natural world is the will of God, then evolution reflects his creative power. So in a very real sense, an evolutionary design to life is part of the inherent fabric of the natural world. That capacity for evolution is built into nature, and I think believers can understand it as part of God's providential plan. I'm certainly not alone in that respect. One of the most distinguished paleontologists in the world is Simon Conway Morris at Cambridge University in England, 
He's written a book basically called Life's Solution about what he regards as the inevitability of evolution to produce creatures like us and being able to understand that as part of a divine plan for the universe itself. So I put it this way, and many times when people know that I am doing my best uh, to be a Christian and to lead that kind of life, ask me, because I, I read about evolution, where do you find room for God in the evolutionary process? And my answer always is, I don't have to find room for God in the evolutionary process, because if God exists, the process is part of the natural world that he made in the first place. And therefore, it, per, it exists to fulfill his design for it. Now, what kind of God could exist in the scientific world of the sort that I work in, in which nature acts according to ordinary, orderly, predictable rules that can be studied and understood and described? And the answer is very simple. A God who fashioned a world that is both rational and intelligible. And that is, in fact, the world in which we live. So to people of faith, God should not be the antithesis of scientific reason. Rather, God is the reason why scientific reason works in the first place, because we live in that rational, intelligible universe. Albert Einstein once wrote that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is the fact that the universe is, it is comprehensible. In other words, the most remarkable thing is that we are actually able to understand the universe and Einstein, of course, had no explanation for that, but he marveled it. Now, I want to show you something else. This is Paul Davies, um, who is a cosmologist and astronomer and physicist. He wrote an article in the New York Times a couple years ago called Taking Science on Faith. And Dr. Davies said he used to really annoy his physics professors in grad school by asking them where the laws of physics come from. And they would either say, go away, kid, you bother me, or as physicists, it's not our job to ask where the laws come from. It's just our, our job to figure them out. But his insight was something outside of nature is actually required to explain the laws of nature. And he wrote that science has a faith-based belief system. All science proceeds on the assumption that nature is ordered in a rational and intelligible way. And if you didn't believe that, you actually couldn't do science. And then he says, religion and science are both founded on faith, mainly on the belief of something outside the universe, like an unexplained God or an unexplained set of physical laws. For that reason, religion and science both fail to provide a complete account of existence. In other words, they need each other. Compatibility of science and faith several times has been a topic of the World Science Festival. And a couple of years ago, I was asked to sit on a panel with two people who thought that science and faith were not compatible, and two people, I mean one of them, who thought that they were. This is the panel that you see right here. Um, and when you look at the panel, here we're having a nice discussion. Um, uh, this is a philosopher from the University of Florida. But I want you to notice that one of the guys on the panel has got a Roman collar on. And this is Brother Guy Consolmagno who is the head of the Vatican Observatory. He's a Jesuit brother, and despite that elegant Italian name, Guy Consolmagno, he's actually a New Yorker. And he has a PhD in physics from Caltech. Um, and Brother Guy has also been questioned about how can you be a scientist and a person of faith? And he's written a number of books to try to explain that. One of the best, I think, is something called God's Mechanics. And he writes about the religious beliefs of scientists and engineers. And when he's asked to justify belief in God, people knowing he's an astronomer uh, ask him, do you see something up there in your telescope that you say, ah, that's God, that makes me believe. And he turns that question on its head. And he says, my belief in God is not because of something I've seen in science. But I turn it around and say, I believe in science because of my faith in God. And there's that rational, intelligible universe again. And his point simply is that science validates faith. And my point is that science needs understanding and support from people of faith. So I want to close in a, in, with, with a couple of points. Uh, this is a wonderful book written by David Heilbronn called The Sun in the Church. And many people will tell you that the Middle Ages, dominated in Europe by the church, were ages of darkness for science. 
It turns out that's not really true. And what Hobburn pointed out in his book is if you go to medieval cathedrals in Europe, and I've gone to a few after I read this book and I found them, you will often find them way up high on the roof, on the ceiling, on the transept, there's a little hole in the ceiling. The hole is designed to be there. And on a sunny day, it allows the sun to shine down and cast a spot. Then on the floor of the cathedral, and medieval cathedrals often didn't have fixed pews, so the floor was wide open, you would see a metal bar laid into the concrete and notations on the metal bar. And the purpose of that was to serve as a solar observatory, to find, for example, the vernal equinox to fix the date of Easter. So it turns out that the church, in effect, and he makes this point, was a funding organization for medieval science and astronomy, and that turns out to be true. Um, one of the great botanists of the Middle Ages was Albertus Magnus, St. Albert the Great, who wrote treatise after treatise on plants and animals. Simply extraordinary. So my closing points are this, and that is faith suffers to the extent that it rejects the gifts of understanding that science provides. And when I speak to people of faith, I always say, it is important for your own faith experience that you not reject science, but that you embrace it. Science suffers by means of the deep hostility that many sciences show to any form of faith. And I've seen that firsthand in a number of ways. And in reality, science and faith both arise from the same human need, which is the desire to understand. And I would say this as well. Any faith that rests on science being wrong is on a shaky foundation. And I believe that basically any faith that, that includes as a tenet of belief the rejection of science is simply not a faith worth having. I oppose what's so-called scientific creationism, not, uh, and I oppose it not only because it's wrong in the scientific sense, but rather because it places nature frankly, in opposition to God. And it demands that we leave mystery alone in nature rather than investigating it as an act of faith. And as a scientist, I simply can, cannot abide to that. My friend, theologian John Hawt, who's at Georgetown University, writing about the current pope when he endorsed evolution of the Big Bang, said, Pope Francis does not merely tolerate the theory of evolution, he embraces it. And my answer to you is that we should embrace and celebrate it too. Thanks so much for having me. Do you believe that the organized anti-evolution sort of movement is a legitimate ideological difference, or is it part of the culture war that, that Ken Ham was talking about? Okay, well that's a very, very good question. And I, I, I honestly believe that it's part of a culture war. And I say that uh, because I read what Ken Ham and other people write. And there's a very famous cartoon. Uh, I can call it up with my laptop, and it might take me a while. But uh, Ken Ham uh, is the leader of the largest anti-evolution organization in the United States. It's called Answers in Genesis. His organization has built the so-called Creation Museum in northern Kentucky. And more recently, they've opened a replica of Noah's Ark called the Ark Park. Um, um, I haven't been to the Ark Park, but I have been to the Creation Museum. Um, and believe it or not, um, my name was on a list of people that if they enter the Creation Museum, they must be accompanied by an escort. Uh, and so I had to have a little minder when I went through the Creation Museum. I thought that was rather interesting. But in this cartoon, he has two castles and they're firing cannon at each other. And one of them is called creation, and one of them is called evolution. And the evolution castle is flying certain banners, and the banners say racism, abortion, euthanasia, uh, moral relativism. So in other words, basically what he's doing is saying if you accept evolution, you're basically buying in to this secular humanist culture that in his opinion is degrading all of American society. And then of course on the other side in their castle, it's authentic values, marriage, family, all of everything except you know the American flag and apple pie on that side. So I think there's a large part of cultural difference in there. Now I have to say something else. 
And that is an awful lot of my own colleagues in the scientific community play into that. And they basically argue um, that what evolution does is to completely invalidate anything that we would regard as a religious narrative to our purpose on Earth or anything else. Like Dawkins. Now, pardon me? Like Dawkins. Like, like Richard Dawkins. Well, I have to tell you, I mentioned the fact that I consider Richard a friend, and I do. And there's a couple reasons for that. For those of you who don't know him, uh, Richard Dawkins is an Oxford evolutionary biologist. And if you want to learn something about evolution, I'm quite serious about this, buy any book that Richard Dawkins has ever written. He is a really, really good writer. Uh, one of his best books um, is called The Selfish Gene. And it's about the evolution of social altruism. In other words, why are we so nice to each other? Why are we good to our families? Um, the Selfish Gene helps to explain that. I think it's brilliantly written. Um, but Richard, uh, uh, and the reason I say Richard is a friend is because he's actually tirelessly promoted my own books in the United Kingdom. And he's told people that, well, if you're a Christian and you doubt evolution, you ought to read Ken Miller's book, Finding Darwin's God. Although Richard and I have also shared the platform twice. And the first time was at a conference at New York University. He came up to me and he said, I've wanted to meet you for a long time. And I said, well, Dr. Dawkins, I'd want to meet you too. And he says, because I admire your writing, Ken, and your work popularizing evolution in the United States, but I just don't understand you. You know, how can you possibly go to church on Sunday or anything else and do that? And I endeavor to explain to him, but unsuccessfully. Um, but but the, the fact is that Richard's best-selling book at, of all time um, is simply called The God Delusion. And um, the God Delusion is very poor theology and even worse science. So that's not the book that I'm recommending that you read. Uh, but the others are extraordinary. But um, my argument with Richard and with quite a few other people is you start out with a core of scientific understanding, and then you take science where it shouldn't be, which is into the cultural war, culture wars, to promote certain attitudes, not just towards religion, but to, towards the way in which society should be structured and so forth. And any person who says, as he has, that bringing your children up within a church is a form of child abuse and it should be outlawed, that's absurd. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Do you think he's acting in good faith? Like, I, 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 I believe Richard is acting very much in good faith. And he, um, the, um, his hostility to religion, quite frankly, I say this as an observer of his writings, his hostility to religion was really sharpened during the uh, terrorist attacks in the British subway that occurred about 10 years ago. This is after 9-11, but it's sort of the British equivalent of 9-11. A number of uh, Islamic terrorists set off bombs in subways and killed close to 100 people. And at that point, he decided, well, it's not just Islam, it's all religions that promote f fanaticism. And therefore, society must be cleansed of religion in order to achieve the kind of society he wants. And I think he's sincere about that. I think he's wrong, but I think he's entirely sincere. Okay. Um, in terms of God's giving us language, there is something that is, there are a lot of things that are really special about our species compared to other species. Um, uh, uh, I have a pet dog, an Australian Shepherd. Um, his name is Sawyer, like Tom Sawyer. If anybody knows uh, Aussies, Australian Shepherds, they are really smart dogs. I'm convinced he has a vocabulary of about 20 words. Um, because he'll react in different ways if I say this, out, meet, sit down, play frisbee. He knows the word frisbee. God does he know the word frisbee. Um, and, and that sort of stuff. Um, so there's no question that other animals, in a sense, can acquire some aspects of the language. And that includes the other primates. But uh, we, as a species, are absolutely unique in that respect. And biologists, for a long time, have pondered why do we have this incredible facility for language? Part of it is this evolutionary explosion over the last million and a half years of one organ, namely the brain. And the human brain proportion or body size is absolutely enormous compared to the other primates. And it's clear that that's part of what gives us the capacity for language. But within scientific circles, there's a debate as to whether the ability to use language actually drove natural selection, which is why we got better and better at having it. Or if the ability to use language was what evolutionary biologists call a standrel, 
an accidental effect of the brain getting bigger. Uh, all of a sudden, the brain got bigger and had this capacity that it never had before, and we human beings started to develop later. That scientific argument is not settled. But in terms of whether or not God gifted us with the capacity for language, um, I would argue that the nature of that gift, uh, and I may not agree with Father Osprey on this particular point, but I would argue the nature of that gift comes out of the evolutionary process itself. Evolution um, is not predictable. It doesn't move in a straight line. But what evolution does is to explore various niches, ways of making a living, within the biological adaptive space. And one of those niches, just waiting to be filled, was for intelligent, aware, self-reflective creatures who could invent language. And we are the first creatures to fill that niche. So I would argue that evolution, which is a process, process of exploring adaptive space, eventually found a creature to go in there. And again, if you believe in God, if you're a person of faith, that entire process is the work of God. And therefore, in effect, that is the way in which God gifted us with language. So Father Nick may not agree with me on that, but we both agree that evolution is the process that produced the human species. Thank you. That's a very provocative question. Thank you for asking. Thank you. All right, let's thank Dr. Miller for his talk.